Well, I'm going to start this evening's proceedings um, just by, first of all, introducing myself. Perhaps not all of you, I doubt, will know I'm Sarah Ansari and I'm currently president of the Royal Asiatic Society and very happy to be so in its um, bicentenary year. So I feel very privileged to be in this position. Mm -hmm. But I do suspect that everybody here um, present this evening, um, for you, Niall, Professor Niall Green will need no introduction. Um, but just for the record, he holds the Ibn Khaldun, yeah, um, Endowed Chair in World History at UCLA. And to quote his own departmental webpage, which obviously I scoured very carefully, he's a historian of the multiple globalizations of Islam and Muslims. Now, after beginning his career as a historian of South Asia, India, Pakistan, in this country, he did his PhD down the road at SOAS, um, having previously studied at KCL and then Cambridge. Uh, much of his subsequent research from his base in the US since 2008 has traced the complex and fascinating Muslim networks that connect you know, far-flung places across many, many parts of the world, including Afghanistan, today's Iran, that whole Indian Ocean world, South Asia, Africa, Japan, and then not forgetting Europe and North America or America. And his previous books have explored such broad and wide-ranging themes or topics, including the interplay between Islam and that aforementioned globalization, the emergence of industrialized religious economies in the Indian, Atlantic, and Pacific Oceans, um, I suppose the global history of Sufism, Sufis, the making of the world's largest Muslim community or group of communities in South Asia, and then the fascinating story of Muslim soldiers in the British Empire. And indeed, <laughs> I remember a pioneering article linked with this last subject that was published in the Society's Journal, the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, um, back in 2008. It was called Jack Sepoy and the Dervishes, Islam and the Indian Soldier in Princely Hyderabad. And it also won the Society's first Staunton Prize. So it's great you know, to have you here this evening talking to us again. I think for me, one of the, I suppose, um, very enviable things about Niall is the way he's able to communicate his scholarship to a range of, of audiences. Um, his 2016 book, I think you came and spoke about it here, didn't you, back in 2016, as I've just said, for instance, reconstructed the beginning of, I suppose, modern Muslim-European exchange by exploring the experiences of those, that small band of young Persian men um, who came to study in Regency Britain in the early 19th century, went by the intriguing title of The Love of Strangers, the, the, sorry, The Love of Strangers, What Six Muslim Students Learned in Jane Austen's London. <laughs> Came out not long, around the time of her bicentenary, perhaps, so Jane Austen was a good move to get into the title. Anyway, today the Society is very pleased, nay honoured, um, to host I hope it is the London launch of your most recent book, How Asia Found Itself, um, or Found Herself, A Story of Intercultural Understanding, published 2022 by Yale. And in it, it examines how, and I'll just hold it up again. I know there are other copies for sale over there, but here we have a copy, which explore, well examines how and in what ways, um, or what intriguing ways, the languages, cultures, religions, of East and Southeast Asia were interpreted in South and West Asia. So precisely for me, the kinds of knowledge exchange that I think lies at the heart of the Royal Asiatic Society's own concerns and priorities today. So that's my introduction. I think I've spoken for far too long. What we're all here to do is to listen to what Nal has to say to us, how he introduces his new book to us, and then we'll, or obviously he'll be very happy to take questions from the floor and from online if people want to. So thank you, Niall, do come and talk to us. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for that, that generous introduction. And really the, the honor's all mine. It's a really a huge personal pleasure and a great honor to be back here at the Royal Asiatic Society. 
I'd like also to thank uh, Alison and, and Matty for arranging the, the logistics and so on of my, of my talk today, inviting me. So we often take the idea of Asia for granted, but Asia is, of course, full of different languages and scripts, different philosophies and literatures, as well as being, of course, a continent of vast distances. So how easy or indeed how difficult was it for the different people of Asia to interpret, understand one another's cultures, not least one another's languages, so many different language systems, let alone languages, so many different writing systems, scripts and character based. My book explores the challenges, the difficulties, as well as the strategies in the modern period that people from different regions of Asia tried to understand their fellow Asians. Indeed, that notion of fellow Asians, the movement of the word Asia into Asian languages is one of the themes of the first part of the book. So the book explores then, as, as uh, Sarah uh, noted, how Southeast and Asia, East Asia were interpreted in Western South Asia and vice versa, which is to say how Burma, today's Myanmar, Japan and China and their languages, cultures, religions, as well as their geography and history were understood in India and the Middle East and indeed vice versa. So the key premises, really, of my book are, first of all, following the evidence. There's been, a, as some of you might know, it's been a sort of a big uh, big buzzword in many ways in Asian studies in the last 10, 15 years of inter-Asian themes or, or trans-Asia type of research. But a great deal of work, pioneering as it's been, has been either based on small bodies of evidence or indeed based on certain theoretical generalizations, particularly, I think, for the the modern period, or indeed the early modern medieval period onwards. What I tried to do in this book primarily is really to assemble a data set of not only inter-Asian interactions, trade exchanges, the movement of people. I'm primarily concerned with the greater challenge of the movement, the transfer, the translation of ideas. So not so much, let's say, of a Silk Road model of the movement of commodities, but the much more complex problem of cross-cultural comprehension. And my basis of the book then is, uh, I suppose, a couple of hundred or more primary sources on which I would laid the foundations of, of trying to understand what was understood and indeed what was misunderstood, or indeed the, the wider gaps of understanding as well as the breakthroughs. I frame this evidence and in interpreting into what I call here a communicational approach, trying to put these individual texts into some sort of wider, uh, wider system, wider actual system that uh, existed through the rise of print, the spread of print technologies into Asian languages, particularly in the languages of South Asia and the Middle East in the early 19th century. Then as the 19th century went on, the second uh, East Asian printing revolution with the adoption, adoption of typography and lithography. This development then of the spread of print technology across Asia, as well as the spread of steam, rail and steamship technologies then, created what I call uh, an Asian communications revolution. Of the movement of people, the printing of books, and the more difficult question then of the interpretation, the translation of books in Asian, different Asian languages, between what was very much a linguistically divided new Asian public sphere of print. This problem then of language script and commensurability, the comprehensibility or lack thereof, of people whose educations were in different languages, and indeed the different uh, conceptual paradigmatic systems of let's say Confucianism vis-a-vis -vis Hinduism or Islam, and of course the various types thereof, is in many ways at the heart of my book there not trying to just assume or look for evidence of connection, but to explore the, the often the disjuncture between connection of peoples and trade goods, and indeed through empires, and the disjunction then with, with comprehension across cultures. This led me to question a number of flawed paradigms that I won't go into now, but I might come back to in the, in the Q&A. 
what I've called the Silk Road model of continuity. The Silk Road, of course, was a term invented through these 19th century new infrastructural connections by the German geologist Baron von Richthofen, who was employed by the ailing Qing uh, imperial government to explore coal deposits for a possible railroad across China. That term, die Seidenstraßen, in German was translated by uh, um, by Richthofen's Swedish student, Sven Heden, into Swedish, it is Siedenwegen, and then translated into a number of other European languages, thence into Japanese, Shiroko Rodo, into Arabic, Tariq al Harar, Al Harir, into Persian as Rahi Abrisham. But this was a very much a modern concept, and indeed a modern concept born of modern infrastructures that I think has been used in various languages, Asian as well as European, in the second half of the 20th century onwards, to construct a history of continuous or more or less continuous connectivity. What I'm looking at in my book, even though I look really on the modern period, from around 1800, 1840 onwards, this new era of a communications revolution, is showing how actually so much of what's often been assumed has been continuously known knowledge across this Silk Road were actually then um, even medieval texts that were only rediscovered in the modern period. The back projection of later knowledge then, things that are known today that we perhaps assume were always known, that were actually much more difficult to, to discover or rediscover. Not least the Indian, as well as the Muslim discovery, or in the Indian case, rediscovery of Buddhism in the 19th century after this religion indeed even lacked a name in early 19th century Islamic language sources. The other term then I put in scare quotes, apologies, such an academic habit, but is Asia, because I'm also questioning the book that this is a universal emic and neutral category. The first chapter of my book actually shows how, of course, the ancient Greek word Asia gets adopted into different Asian languages in the 19th century through this new age of steam and print. You can see here one of the earliest of these, then actually a, a translation of uh, the famous uh, Dutch um, atlases, which were translated uh, um, into Ottoman Turkish in the later 17th century, and then finally printed with the beginnings of Ottoman print in the 1770s. But more fully, it's in the 19th century when the term Asia moves then into the public sphere, at least, across the continent itself, whether as Asia in Japanese or Asia in a range of Middle Eastern languages. And of course, this external concept of Asia was alternatively not known to most, <laughs> so to speak, sorry, do the scare quotes, Asians, or indeed always competed with indigenous, older terms, or indeed alternative concepts of belonging, or of geography, or indeed of commonality. And when it was used by various Asian figures, it was used in a whole series of different contested and often competing ways. I often begin talking about the book, as I do in the book itself, by a very famous meeting in the midst of Asia, let's say, and indeed what I argue is the communicational hub of inter-Asian understanding in the 19th and 20th century, and that city is Calcutta. And it was there in the early 1900s, there was a famous meeting known to many scholars between the, the Japanese art historian Okakura Kazuko and Rabindranath Tagore. And it was there written in Calcutta, although not published until it's only, only published in English, not in any Asian language until many decades later. Uh, Okakura's famous declaration in his book, The Ideals of the East, Asia is one. Rather assuming that unity, my book asks a series of question, questions. If it was one, it was claimed as being one by figures like Okokoda or other pan-Asianists, or simply Asianists as we call them in the scholarship nowadays. On whose terms was such unity being predicated? On the Buddhist terms, the figures like Okokoda and, uh, and Tagore, who largely excluded Islam from the story of Asia, on a series of other projections of a certain notion of Asian unity. Throughout the book, then, I actually argue for a process, a kind of dialectic of self-discovery, as I call it, between the projection of the self, the projection of one form of Asian selfhood, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, various versions thereof, 
between the projection of the self and the discovery and appreciation of the Asian other. Ooh. Oh, we've had a flash through to who at the end there. Okay, sneak preview. Mm. So how and where do I do this? Well, I take a number of, as it were, different theaters or different regions that are sort of in, in interaction. One uh, that I begin with, with a couple of chapters, is the Bay of Bengal, a place that's often been assumed in scholarship in the last few decades as being, in a sense, the, the paradigmatic space, uh, space of inter-Asian interactions uh, and, indeed, understanding. And by looking at, then, interactions, particularly in Burma, today's Myanmar, was a majority Buddhist country. I look at a series of texts written in Persian, in Urdu, um, indeed in other languages of figures that turn up there in, in Burma, as well as English text, to try to understand, missionaries, to try to understand, well, even in that smallest theater of inter asian interactions between Hindus, and Muslims of various kinds, and indeed Baha'is who arrived from Iran, and European and Indian Christians. How easy or how difficult was it to understand the religion, the culture, and indeed the languages of Burma? And actually, I begin here with a series of early Christian missionary translations into Burmese, and here a series of early Christian missionary, Protestant missionary polemics, as I call them here, or indeed critiques of Burmese Buddhism. And what I actually show is over a period of around a century, there goes from a period of, let's say, whether Christian missionaries, or indeed the Muslim, the Hindu, the Sri Lankan Buddhist, and indeed the Baha'i Iranian missionaries, for whom, for whom Burma isn't a place to understand and appreciate the religion of the Asian other, but actually a place to project Christianity, Islam, Baha'ism, Hinduism, with the new conversionist missionary Hinduism of the Arya Samaj, founded in Bombay in the 19th century. But as I show by tracing around a century of texts, we move from a polemical phase then, or at least a, a phase of conversionism, such as texts such as this, as the public sphere expands into Burma, the first ever books printed in Burmese are by Protestant missionaries, American and then British, Baptist and others. And then we have printing being established by non-Christians, but also for these proselytizing purposes. One of the most fascinating uh, set of documents I found was um, um, Al-Ashraq, the East or the Orient, a Baha'i, the new religion of the 19th century from Iran, becoming a world religion, and a magazine being uh, issued in Persian, in Urdu, and in Burmese, and printed in Burma for the purpose of converting Buddhists, and indeed for converting Muslims as well. This led to a series of reactions in Urdu and other languages as well. A series of polemics then of this Indian polemical public sphere that comes with print that spreads into Burma and beyond, as well as in Sri Lanka, another theme of this section of the book, another space of Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian encounter. As late as the 1890s, I found, in one of the most fascinating for me, at least, books, primary sources I found, there was not, uh, well, let me start with a text. Abdul Khalik Seri Barma, a North Indian Muslim who was raised around 80 miles from the birthplace of the historical Buddha. He makes a journey to Burma, Seri Barma. He stays there for several decades as one of these new Muslim missionaries adopting the techniques of Christian missionaries. He learns Burmese. He has a table of the Burmese alphabet. There are a series of Burmese texts that he discusses and whose titles he transcribed. I checked this with a scholar of Burmese, and these are, are indeed classic texts of the, the uh, Burmese, as well as the Pali, uh, uh, Tipik Taka, uh, uh, Burmese Buddhist, uh, uh, Theravada Buddhist uh, canon. And yet his purpose is to understand this religion in order to refute it. A compassionate polemicism, of course, a critical anthropology to be able to, of course, save the souls of the Burmese, who we saw very compassionately as fellow humans, but nonetheless were dis 
uh, misled by their religion. The book reaches its, uh, its, apogee, its apogee, its zenith with a public debate, at least so the author claimed, with the Tetana Beng, the prelate of Burmese Buddhism in Mandalay, some of my own research photographs there for you to see. But as I started to, well, actually, one of the most striking things about this text there was as late as 1893, from a very educated Indian alim who knows a series of languages, Arabic as well as Urdu, and he's learned Burmese, can read the script. He doesn't have a name in his own language for what would say, well, it's Buddhism. That's what I've been saying all along. The only name he can come up with and uses for the text, for the text for this religion that we now call Buddhism, is the Mazhabi Barma, the religion of Burma. Indeed, the founder of this religion, Shin Gautama, what we think, oh, Gautama, the historical Buddha, is seen as someone who was born in China. So again, even in that region, that close area of connection of the Bay of Bengal, someone who was raised in what we now think of as the historical heartland of Buddhism, has this very, at once, pioneeringly brilliant understanding. He's reading the Burmese scriptures, but he doesn't go to Burma with any preconception or even a word for the Buddhist religion. As the, in the second half of the 19th century, though, there are other developments going on in other Indian languages, which will spread then into Middle Eastern, West Asian languages. And these are then very much involved with a series of collaborations, cooperations between Indian scholars using Sanskrit manuscripts to re rediscover Indian Buddhist history, and then a series of no longer polemical Christian or European and American okay. scholars, but European scholars and writers, Orientalists, missionaries, and indeed theosophists, for whom the Buddha is a wondrous human uh, figure who is in many ways, in at least the version told by Edwin Arnold in his very famous long book-length poem, The Light of Asia, this is a Christological, a Christ-like Buddha. So the interactions with Christianity are still there with this European and American appreciation rather than rejection of the Buddha, but having been filtered through this Christ-like conception, historicized rather than, as it were, the Buddha of many deities and incarnations, theological Buddha of many forms of Buddhism, and then the Orientalist translation of texts, such as F. Max Müller, the German Oxford-based Orientalist, makes his translation of the Dharmapada. The Dharmapada, as far as I've been able to establish, is, is the first ancient Buddhist text then, or indeed Buddhist scriptural text, translated into modern South Asian languages. It's translated, we can see here, into Bengali, and translated into Urdu via Max Müller's translation. Colonel Alcott, co-founder of the Theosophical Society, himself becomes a Buddhist, creates a new kind of, sometimes called by scholars, occult Buddhism. His works then are translated or used by Indian theosophists to write books like this one in the middle there, Kalyan Dharam. Paul Karras, German theologian, an author of the Gospel of Buddha, again, this Christological conception, translated into Indian languages. And Arnold, as I mentioned, the uh, um, Arnold's very long poem. This is translated into at least half a dozen different Indian languages, as well as into Japanese, Sinhala, and other Buddhist languages. So we're seeing then this, as it were, interconnected, not so much an Asian self-discovery as a Eurasian one. By the early 20th century then, not least through archaeological input and the rise of the nationalist ideologies across Asia, this rediscovery of, of Buddha has gone from a rediscovery to a reclaiming of Buddhism. By 1931, as after the first generation of Afghan scholars had worked along with the uh, Delegation Archaeologique Française on Afghanistan, the French archaeological mission, the first works in, uh, in any modern rather than ancient Afghan language on Buddhism are being translated and being written in, uh, in Dari Persian. And by 1931, then, we have an Afghan postage stamp then 
designed by an Afghan artist who had studied in Munich, and the Buddha being claimed now as national heritage. By the time, of course, Indian independence comes, the uh, wheel of Dharma or the Ashokan wheel then is placed, of the Buddhist emperor of ancient India, is placed upon the flag as the symbol of an independent national India, of a religion that conveniently doesn't really exist amidst the communal conflict of Indian independence. So this whole series then of uh, reclaiming then of the Buddha as national heritage. I'll turn now to the next, as it were, theater, or the next set of interactions I look at then, the South Asian, the Indian, and the West Asian Middle East and discovery of Japan. Here too, it's through a series of interactions, collaborations, the sharing of knowledge across Eurasia, that an understanding of Japan comes to, uh, comes to appear in the languages of modern West and South Asia. Certainly, I'm well familiar with texts like the Sapano Suleimani, the, the 17th century, late 17th century Persian account of a Safavid trade mission to, to Siam, to, to today's Thailand, that also includes an, an indirect account of Japan from the 17th century in Persian. But two things. Even that 17th century account seemed to come from Dutch merchants who were allowed to trade in Japan, and of course were coming back through Thailand. And indeed, there's no evidence that that Safinai Suleimani, that text, circulated in manuscript form until its publication by a distinguished Iranian scholar in the late 20th century. So Japan had to be discovered anew. The word in West and South Asian languages for Japan isn't some version of Nihon or Nippon in older Japanese, the indigenous name for the country. It's a version of the European names. Japan, Japon, or variations thereon in different South and West Asian languages. I've traced back at least what I can find as the earliest version of that happens with those 18th century, late 18th century Ottoman publications of the Latin maps of, uh, of Grotius, the famous uh, Dutch uh, cartographer. And from Grotius's Latin, we have it written in Arabic script as Japonia. And then we have the movement then of Again, this via Latin then of uh, the European names for Japan. By the early 1900s then, this steam and print Asian communications revolution is leading to books about Japan in Western South Asian languages. But the great problem with interpreting Japan is the challenge of not only the spoken language, but more particularly the written language, which brings about a pattern I saw particularly between the Eastern uh, interactions between South Asia and, 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 and the Middle East and East Asia, the real big challenge then, as I say, of language and script. So the, a text like this, as you can see here from 1904, a very uh, important Iranian intellectual, subsequent prime minister who goes by the Trans-Siberian Railroad, those steam networks to Japan, as well as China, writes a very detailed book on Japan that includes even Japanese loan words. So we've got some real linguistic progress here. Much more sympathetic accounts of the religion of Japan, and indeed the religions of Japan, the earliest account of Shinto I found in the Middle Eastern language. But here too, as someone who had been a student in Germany, a new, Jap a new, new German, actually used German to communicate with Chinese in the German treaty port of Qingdao, uh, uh, if I remember the name correctly. And you can see here at the bottom here, it's why I chose this image, that we have the, the Japanese of the diamond edition of humanity. And that's a quotation from a popular American long-term resident and writer on Japan, Elizabeth Gordon. What we see then is this pattern I found then so often of what professional interpreters call pivot languages. When in a period when there's simply no dictionary or grammar between languages like Japanese and Arabic or Japanese and Hindi or Chinese and, and Urdu or, you know, you name it, let alone a sort of a whole series of available translators who knew these different languages and their scripts. It's a very common practice in publishing and translation to this day, to rely on a pivot language, a language, English, which is known to Japan, more Japanese speakers, as well as more 
speakers of Indian and Middle Eastern languages, or French, or indeed German. So I trace this development then of greater knowledge and understanding through this Asian communications network that, of course, is part of a larger Eurasian communications network. So 1897, a merchant, so much of the scholarship on the Indian Ocean, the Silk Road, inter-Asian interactions is focused upon trade. Trade shows connectivity and an assumption often that that leads to cosmopolitanism. Much of what I'm questioning is this interplay between connection and comprehension. So I tried to look out actually for merchants and accounts that they've written. What did merchants know and transfer back to their fellow countrymen or people who could read their languages? As it turns out, very few merchants actually wrote books, so they weren't transmitting that much knowledge after all. Sensible when you think about it, because their cultural linguistic knowledge was a professional trading asset. They didn't want to make it available to their potential competitors. But Ibrahim Sahabash, an Iranian merchant who goes to China, sorry, goes to Japan in 1897, he writes a, a manuscript, again, not published until the later 20th century, so not actually available in the public sphere, but gives a sense of what an Iranian knew in 1897, an Iranian who'd been there. No loan words, no Japanese terms. Japanese society is seen entirely through what we might call Islamicate terms. This is land of mullahs, for example. This is a, a place where Buddhism is still conceived as Budparasti, idol worship. And the great uh, Iron Buddha Kamakura, which is the one he seems to visit, which he goes inside it, as many tourists do, is a sign of a great spectacle, but it's still a great but, an idol. There's also a sense here of the strangeness of the food, sort of a sense of Levi Strauss here, of the as food as a, a real marker of commensality, of shared culture, eating together, or indeed of cultural variation and difference, of otherness. What I think is perhaps the probably the first Persian account of sushi. Mahi Khan Kibadun raw fish they eat with two sticks. As good a definition as any. But this isn't the sushi lovers of uh, modern, let's say, kind of a uh, Iranian diaspora culture. This is a food which is strange, uh, typifying then for Sahab Bashi the, the otherness of Japan. But there's a big change, and that change comes in 1904 with the Japanese imperial defeat of Imperial Russia. Not only, of course, the famously the first defeat of a major European empire by an Asian power, but also for Iranians, the old enemy, the enemy on the doorstep, which in the 1820s, of course, had chopped off much of Iranian territory in the Northwest. So we see across Asia, whether in Malay, whether in Arabic, whether in this remarkable Afghan text picturing here in this kind of fantastical sort of steampunk, steampunk style depictions of the defeat of the uh, Russian Imperial Navy in the uh, Sea of Japan whether in this Persian, uh, Iranian history in two volumes of, of the Japanese, Russo-Japanese War, or this great epic poem in Persian based on the Shahnameh, the great Persian national epic, as it would be called in the 20th century, called the Mikado Nama, the Book of the Mikado. But in all of these books, the information was direct, taken as the author of the Middle Text says, from French and Russian sources. And in the case on the right, this was published in Calcutta. I was even able to identify the source of the picture here, as well as the information. It was actually from a, um, um, at that point, a very well-known war illustrator, uh, Johannes, I think his name was, Kirkuk, who was a Dutch war illustrator who was in the theater of war there and sent back images, which were published in the, the uh, Illustrated London Times, which went out to Calcutta, the, Exile Iranian publisher in Calcutta gets a local Indian or Bengali artist, Bosa, you can see the name there, to copy them. And then these images then circulate with the Mikardan army, the epic story of the, of the emperor of Japan's defeat of Imperial Russia, move back to Iran. So we've seen some really complex intellectual informational as well as uh, image circulations. But this Japanophilia then that spreads into Ottoman Turkish. The Ottomans is another fellow imperial power 
with the Japanese, had already had established relations with Japan before the Russo-Japanese War, leading to two uh, senior Ottoman military officers to be official observers there. When they came back, one of them wrote, I think it was in, I can't remember, it's four or six volume Ottoman account of the Russo-Japanese War. Including those elements, a little short section, those elements of Japanese history and culture, which help explain how Japan managed to rise up so quickly. So culture is interesting as it, as, insofar as it shows lessons of self-empowerment that the Ottomans themselves, of course, having had so much of their empire, not least in Ukraine and southeastern Europe, taken away from by the Russians or by Russian allies since the second half of the 18th century, the Ottomans wanted to know. So this encounter and appreciation of the Japanese other for the purpose of the empowerment of the Ottoman self. We start to have this period too, the beginnings of Japanese Orientalism. Sometimes these are then in cases of uh, Japanese intelligence officers learning about the Middle East, going to Iran as an embassy, writing books in Japanese about Iran. Again, in many cases, you are using European terms. Perusia from Persia becomes the Japanese name for Iran at this point. Or indeed works like um, Hayden Silk Road, translated from the English into, as I mentioned, Shiroko Rodo in, in, I think, 1938 in Japan. But you also have these appreciations of the Asian other that come about as well. The conversion of the first Japanese Muslim to Islam, celebrated here on the front page of an Ottoman newspaper. And it's also in Afghanistan as well. Who wants to know these lessons of self-empowerment from Japan. A translation here, again, not from Japanese. These languages are too different. There are no dictionaries, there are no grammars, there's no, as it were, at least that I found of, uh, readers of both languages in this period in the 1910s. But the great uh, Afghan nationalist Mahmoud Tarzi was able to translate from Ottoman, having spent much of his life in exile in the Ottoman Empire, and translate then the, the six volumes, I think it comes out in Dari Persian, in Kabul, in the 1910s, of this long account of Japan, but primarily focusing upon the war, with a little bit, a few pages on religion and culture. When this is printed, this is the longest book ever printed by this point in Afghanistan. Printing only began there 40 years earlier and sort of stopped for a number of decades. Gives you a sense of the scope of this Japanophilia that swept across Western South Asia. And yet that wasn't necessarily Japanology because the language, spoken language, but especially the written language presented great challenges. Here at another, actually quite well known, um, at least to autumn, late Ottomanist, um, text written by a Siberian Tatar who flees Imperial Russia, goes to Japan, tries to convert the Japanese to Islam. The whole ru rumors that the Japanese emperor has converted to Islam, or he will, or we should try. So these Muslim missionaries, again, this projection of the South that comes to Japan and indeed other regions of Asia. And um, our Tatar here, Abdurrashid Ibrahim, gives an, a, uh, a representation of the Japanese writing system here, katakana, hiragama, and yamotogana, if I can read from the transcript to my screen here. And yet when we look at the, the description at the top there in Ottoman, what's the word used to conceive the Japanese script? Hieroglyph, hieroglyphs. And uh, Abd al-Rashid Ibrahim, at least by this point in 1911, when his book is published in, in Istanbul, across the full stretch of Asia's public sphere now then, from uh, Yokohama, in Japan, to Istanbul, we have a sense of the language, but not an ability to yet to read it. I was able to find in a few languages, in, in Gujarati, in Urdu, uh, a few vocabularies, a few vocabulary books with sometimes short phrases or expressions in Japanese. This is, of course, a great breakthrough in inter-Asian communication. But there were two issues here. One that, or, or three issues, perhaps, actually. One that the vocabulary was primarily mercantile. 
how to buy this or that, how to find a hotel, how much does this or that cost? There were a large number of Indian merchants that were in the ports of Japan, Yokohama and Kobe, where the first mosque of Japan is uh, established in 1933. But this is not a vocabulary of, let's say, literary, cultural, religious, philosophical understanding. It's not going to help an Indian understand Zen. Another thing, of course, is, as you will see, apart from sometimes in English transcription, pronunciation purposes, the words are all, the Japanese words are all transcribed into either Gujarati script or the Arabic script for Urdu. So even if someone masters this whole vocabulary, and I dare say people did, they might be able to speak Japanese in a certain measure. There's no grammar in these books. But of course, they'll not be able to read a single uh, character or part of the other Japanese uh, alphabetical system stuff. There were other attempts to learn Japanese. The Ottomans uh, made a small attempt. The Ottoman military college then uh, uh, printed an, uh, a Japanese alphabetic, a Japanese alphabetical primer. But that was, again, only the very basics of one of uh, the, the three Japanese uh, script systems. And indeed, our friend Rabindranath Tagore, the great sort of, uh, you know, kind of pan-Asianist figure whose works were translated, indeed, into Chinese and Japanese in the 1910s and 20s, albeit from English, where the version would work together with W.B. Yeats. Tagore, a keen Japanophile, wants to establish the teaching and the reading of Japanese at uh, his newly founded Chantaniketan University in, uh, in Bengal. He even manages to employ a Japanese language teacher, Sino Jin, uh, Jinosuke, who sets up classes but he only teaches nine students who enrolled, all of them children. And he left after was it a year or less to work as a military advisor in an Indian princely state. So these attempts, but there were, as again, these great challenges of language and script. So much so then that so many texts then were translated via pivot languages of French or English. Or when we have travelers going to Japan, the more intellectually curious would, as it were, um, what's the word I've used, indulge in a, a strategy of interpretive leverage to build on their understanding of what they saw on their visits and travels around Japan by reading books in French or German, or in Russian in some cases, to be able to understand what it was they were looking at. I discuss, of course, the issues here. Why was this the case? Why did not, for example, Indians or Iranians have language schools? Well, of course, there was no school of Oriental studies, as SOAS was then in India. So there are various, of course, imperialism plays a story here. It also plays a story from the Japanese side. One most, another of the most enjoyable texts I worked with was the most detailed first-hand account of Japan that I found at least in any South Asian or Middle Eastern language from the period I'm looking at then, so about 1840, 1940. And that's this text here, the Hakika to Japan, the truth about Japan, in two volumes, about 600-odd pages in type total. Its author, Father Dim Fazli, the gentleman there on the right, was employed as a language teacher, teaching Hindustani, Urdu, uh, as well as Persian at the uh, Tokyo Gaikou Go Gakko, the Japanese Tokyo Imperial Language School, the equivalent of SOAS in Japan. There were a series of other language teachers there for Imperial Japan's intellectual, but of course also strategic, military and mercantile policies, teaching languages like Mongolian, Malay, um, and uh, other Asian languages. But Urdu was particularly important as having been seen as the as Hindustani, the lingua franca of India. So Fazli is employed there by the existing uh, Urdu professor there, Gamo Rechi, the gentleman on the left, to, to teach Urdu and Persian to Japanese students. And yet, it's clear there from Fazli's own words that he wasn't allowed, Fazli, the, the Indian teacher, wasn't allowed to speak or attempt to speak Japanese with either his students or his professor. And indeed, the travelogue section of his book, one part is the travelogue his experience, the other is what he's drawn on from the bibliography of European language books and one earlier Urdu book on Japan. His travelogue explains that the people he was spending time with in Japan 
were either other exile teachers. There's a Malay uh, Marxist who's teaching at the, uh, the language school. There are a number of Muslims, Tatars and others with whom he befriends. There's a Japanese Muslim who actually turns out, he doesn't realize this, I don't think, turns out to be a, a spy for Imperial Japan. But he's not officially allowed to learn Japanese. His students, as well as his professor, his employer, Gamma Odaichi, do learn Urdu to such a level that I was able to find uh, articles, short essays, written in Urdu by Raichi and a number of uh, Japanese students of Urdu. So what we have then here is even within Asia, asymmetrical informational and linguistic exchange. So again, if Asia is one, well, that's not necessarily a, uh, an, an equal or as one would say, perhaps an equitable one. And of course, from all sides then, there's this experience of the projection of the self amid the appreciation of the Asian other. So through the 1930s, a, a quite large, around a thousand uh, Tatar Muslims had settled in Japan. They'd supported the uh, the uh, Russian Empire in its battles against the Bolsheviks and had fled across Asia as refugees and settled in Japan. They set up a printing press in Japan, in, in, in Tatar Turkic, and are patronized and helped by a series of Japanese corporations, and indeed the Japanese uh, state and another number of nationalist organizations for Japan's own purposes. What this leads to is the uh, publishing from Tokyo in 1934 of the Japanese, the so-called Tokyo Koran, which is then exported by the Japanese foreign ministry to 33 different Muslim countries around Asia as part of this diplomatic exchange that Imperial Japan is establishing in this period. There's a Tatar Turkic periodical, Yeni Japan Mukhbari, the New Japan Informer, which is published in uh, Tokyo by the Tatars, and again, distributed through Japan's newly established foreign ministries as far as places like Kabul, when embassies established in the early 30s. But what this effectively is, is, is vicarious Japanese propaganda, including an account of the uh, translation of the Quran into Japanese as well, albeit a translation of the Quran into Japanese, as in the first translation of the Quran into Chinese, made from German or English uh, prior translations, these pivots again. Nonetheless, even if vicarious, we do, of course, have some Japanese scholars of Arabic emerging in this period, as well as a mention of Persian and Urdu. Nonetheless, they, they do lead to new appreciations. In the 1930s, then, we even have the uh, of translations from the poems, the 8th century, if I remember correctly, the 8th century classical Japanese poems of the Manyoshu, the great earlier anthology of classical Japanese poetry, been translated and printed in Kabul, Afghanistan. Extraordinary thing. But they're translated by a, an English version. Hence, in this Kabul uh, translation of the Manyoshu, the comparisons are made of the Manyoshu Japanese poems to the poems of Shelley and Wordsworth. It's again, we're in a picture of larger Eurasian uh, intellectual interactions. Well, the last chapter of my story I'll tell you about then is China. The biggest challenge of all, not just because of the sheer size of China, the language system, of course, uh, a written tradition that goes back a millennia, of course. We're trying to learn about Chinese history. There's a lot of history, there's a lot of literature to try to master. But also, of course, the problem that imperial China, the waning Qing Empire, and indeed then uh, the, the, the Republic of Japan, does not allow foreigners to travel to the interior. There's not a railroad anyway, apart from what we can see on this map of these short branches from the treaty ports, such as Shanghai and others, uh, and the Russian uh, railroad junction at, at Mukden and then Harbin of the north, down to Peking and uh, well, Beijing and a few other cities. So here we see a map of the great sort of 19th, early 20th century Tatar, Siberian, Siberian Tatar globetrotter, whose hieroglyphic account of Japanese writing we saw a few slides earlier. Yet for his journey to China, 
as well as to Japan. He has to go by the Trans-Siberian Railroad skirting around the Chinese Empire, as it still was then, then go from the treaty ports, the European treaty ports, by a little bit of inland journeys as far as Beijing, but the whole of the interior he can't get to. He's not allowed. And even if he were allowed, of course, it would be extremely difficult. And then his return journey, or his journey on to Istanbul, then across Asia, he takes via steamship and railroad networks again. Nonetheless, when he goes to Beijing, he does manage to speak with some locals. He goes to the famous New, New Jew uh, Mosque, the Ox Street Mosque. There he meets a couple of Japanese fellow Muslims who've, by this point, been on the Hajj through these new steam routes. They've been to Mecca. If I remember correctly, these were, um, it might have been one of the Chinese Muslims who've been brought to the Ottoman Empire, having its own outreach to fellow Muslims, its own imperial purposes. So the language in which they communicated wasn't Chinese, nor was it Turkish. It was Arabic as a pivot language in this case. But through a series then of other pivot texts, mercantile networks, but primarily missionary knowledge, that the communication or railroad and particularly steam networks then, these are mercantile economic infrastructure, but the knowledge of China that passes through these printing presses and on ships from Shanghai to Calcutta and beyond are largely missionary texts. Fascinating two-volume, another Urdu book here then, a really early account of history of the Chinese Empire, the Tariq Imam al published in Calcutta in uh, 1845 in two big fat volumes. Incredibly detailed, gives a, a summary of the Xu Jing, the ancient Chinese text that were early, the earliest founding, foundational text that was seen then of Chinese historiography, the history of ancient China, at this time attributed to Confucius, gives a summary of that, gives descriptions of all different parts of Japan, sorry, of China, I should say, bringing an extraordinary amount of, of information, detailed information, what would be subsequently uh, discredited information, but nonetheless, a big informational expansion of knowledge about China in a South Asian language, in a lingua franca at that point across much of South Asia. Indeed, it was a lingua franca because that author wasn't Indian. He was Irish. His name was James Corcoran. He couldn't read Chinese. He was an official translator for the East India Company, Sadhara Iralat, the sort of revenue bureau, didn't know a word of Chinese. He had to rely upon the missionary Medhurst translation of the Xu Jing, that historical text, as well as other missionary accounts of China. But nonetheless, he transfers this understanding, these representations, if you will, into Urdu. By 1864, then, we have Chiner Itahasa, a Bengali, literally, history of China. But again, as the, uh, the author uh, explains in the preface, and we can actually see there a quotation, of course, from, from Johnson on the, on the uh, an epigraph there on the front page. The, translator, the author is, again, drawing upon uh, European, and in other cases, these texts draw on American uh, accounts of, of Japan and as well as China. In 1868, we have a fascinating Gujarati text. Uh, there's an article by, from graduate student of mine, a very important original article in the Journal of Asian Studies uh, about a year ago, on this Gujarati text, the Chinani, Musaf Chinani Musafari, Journey to China by, from 1868 by a Bombay merchant. But again, for much of his understanding of Chinese culture, he's having to information leverage his own observations by using missionary and other translations. And again, sorry, these texts I'm looking at are all coming out of this particular infrastructural geography. This new public sphere is relying upon a series of port cities that become informational bridgeheads, printing centers, whether Shanghai, whether Calcutta, whether Singapore, whether Bombay, or indeed Istanbul at the other end of Asia. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why some parts of Asia, Afghanistan, Xinjiang, Chinese ruled Central Asia, Iran, perhaps surprisingly, being off this port city-based um, informational infrastructure are much slower and later 
in access to knowledge and what texts they do translate. Texts translate into Persian as late as the 1900s are often really outdated. They don't have access to the newest books or magazines. One of the most, again, I keep saying this, but uh, yeah, it was a fascinating book for me to research and write. So a whole bunch of really fascinating books, but perhaps the most surprising one uh, I found uh, is this text you can see on the right, published in, uh, in uh, 1893 in, uh, in Bombay. There was a slightly earlier version in Calcutta. So again, these port cities. And it's a text which describes itself as a history of China. It mentions in the preface, it's published by an exiled Iranian um, uh, publisher. It's much freer to publish in British India than it was in Iran with the censorship. The technology, as well as the term censor, censor, have been adopted into Persian, along with printing from Europe in the 19th century. So many Iranian publishers were more active in India, including the beginnings of the first Baha'i. Uh, the Baha'i scriptures were published in Bombay rather than in Iran. And the the publisher's introduction says this was translated by an English priest, and the counter China translated from English by an English priest, and then, uh, so written in English by an English priest, a priest called Padre Ixus, and a very English name, <laughs> and translated into Persian by called someone called Muhammad Zaman. Well, as I sort of worked my way through the lithograph, as time went on, I just had a, an inkling, a hunch. Could it be? Could could it, could it possibly be the famous Latin account of Ming China by Matteo Ricci, albeit written 250 years earlier in Venetian dialect? The diary is carried back to Europe by another Jesuit, translated in Latin, published in Augsburg, carried east somehow and translated in India. Well, as I managed to piece together um, the backstory of the text, it also been discovered, and, and uh, at the same time, then by a uh, by an Italian uh, scholar who's also uh, working on this as well. Um, but it turns out that actually, what we have here is a 17th century Safavid translation, an Iranian translation from the Latin by a, a Shi'i Muslim convert to Christianity who decided, after going to Rome, accepting Christianity, having been sent there to learn Latin in order to refute it decides he won't go back to Safavid Persia because a number of converts have been executed in Isfahan. He goes to Mughal India at the more famously tolerant court of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Prince Dari Shikoh. And when he's there, now as a Christian, he starts hanging out with Jesuits in one of these Jesuits' house. And actually a, a Flemish rather than English Jesuit, Padre, he comes across this Latin account of China. And together they translate into Persian. But again, the timeline, it sits around in manuscript for 200 years until it's printed uh, in Calcutta and then Bombay in the 1890s because there's a new interest in Iran, in China, I postulate, because of Iranian merchants are trading with China as well as um, with Japan. The whole series of self-projections to China, though, as well, as well as there being Baha'i missionaries to Japan, the new Iranian religion, Baha'i missionaries who have to communicate in Esperanto, a language invented, of course, as by a, a Polish ophthalmologist. There are a series of other self-projections of other Asian cultures into Japan. The great Buddhist missionary and protege of the Theosophical Society, um, Dharmapala, you see his image down the left, travels to, to China and tries to preach his reformed version of Buddhism. But actually that self-projection of a Salonese Buddhist self is rejected by local Chinese Buddhists and public di discussions he has with them. We have this fascinating Indian pioneer sociologist, Benoit uh, Kumar Sarkar, who publishes his book there in English, as we can see, in, uh, in Shanghai, and describes himself learning about the Chinese religion, Confucianism, through the missionary library, the Christian Protestant missionary library there in Shanghai. But having used European Christian missionary texts to understand China, he then wants to incorporate China in a Hindu-based 
rather than the Buddhist-based vision of Asian unity by interpreting Chinese religiosity in Hindu terms, and indeed as a version of Hinduism. Later on, we even have an attempt to found a pan-Hindu temple in Japan in the 1930s by Indian, as it were, what we call now Hindu nationalists, and indeed attempts to understand Japanese religiosity as having drawn from an Asia's Ur culture, now being seen as Hinduism. And indeed Bushido, a claim that Bushido was actually a version of the martial techniques of ancient Hindu Kshatriya warriors. And yet these attempts then to see and interpret the unity of Asia through either Hindu or Buddhist eyes are being rejected by various Chinese scholars. Not least the great Chinese intellectual, philosopher, modernizer, patriot, uh, Hu Shi. And uh, in his famous essay, The Indianization of China, at the same time that we have a series of Bengali sinologists who have been learning uh, ancient Chinese to understand the translation of ancient Sanskrit, Indian Buddhist texts into, uh, into Chinese then. At the same time, various uh, Indian Buddhologists, indeed sinologists, are framing Asian unity and, and, uh, in Buddhist terms. Indeed, China and Chinese culture is being based on an Indian-derived Buddhism as Buddhism then, as the Indian Ur culture unifying Asia, intellectuals like Hu, uh, Hu Xie, particularly in his famous essay, The Indianization of China, says, no, no, no. It was when we adopted Buddhism that we all started to go wrong here in China. Until we adopted Buddhism, we had our own Confucian methods of science and astrology, great progress. It was the Indian impact, the Indianization of China that held us back. So rather than seeing as a lot of scholarship has, interactions across Asia through the terms of Pan-Asian Pan -Asianist ideologues, whether Okakura or indeed in some ways the more kind of spiritualized unity envisioned by Tagore, what I actually found was the much better known Anglophone Pan-Asianists writing in English, like Okakura, his ideals of the East, Asia is one, wasn't translated into Japanese, until the 19, like till 30 or 40 years later, let alone into any other Asian language until the 1990s, not into any Indian languages. Those ideologues weren't actually very active in the gritty, hard linguistic and ethnographic work of trying to understand different Asian cultures on their own terms. But some did. As I mentioned, then we have Prabod Chandra Bhavchi, pioneering Indian sinologist, learning classical Chinese albeit to understand the transmission of Indian Buddhism. And he does so by traveling to China, but also traveling to, uh, to Indochina and studying with French sinologists in, uh, in what we now call Vietnam, as well as in Paris. He becomes a real a colleague, as we would say now, with French sinologists. Again, a picture of Eurasian cooperation rather than the closed model of, of inter-Asian interactions. Again, we see in this translation here into Urdu of the famous travelogue of the 7th century Chinese Buddhist pilgrim, Xuanzang. As many of you know, Xuanzang's travelogue having been translated into French and then by the missionary Beale, who I think I saw his plaque in St. Pancras' church just earlier today over the road. Um, uh, Beale's translation, which was in turn used as the, as it were, the, the map on the ground for the archaeological rediscovery of, of India by uh, Colonel Cunningham and the Archaeological Survey of India. In turn, then, that translation from English is translated into Urdu. Uh, we have here, Ekchini Safar, Ekchini Siyakir Safarnami, a Chinese traveler's travelogue. Not even the transliteration of the name Xuanzang translated from the English here. So again, this use of a European pivot language to understand the ancient connections between India and China. Earlier in the library here today, I was looking at an Urdu translation from the 19, sorry, 1890s of Ibn Battuta. Of course, famously traveled all over Asia, didn't he? It'd be like any world history text textbook or any account of inter-Asian understanding is going to tell you about Ibn Battuta's travels from Tangier to Canton and everywhere in between. 
And yet we can't assume that that knowledge, that Arabic text, was available in manuscript over the succeeding centuries from the, the 1300s. In fact, it was only in Paris that the first printed editions were made. When the first Arabic printed edition was made, was uh, issued in Cairo in the 1860s, if I recall correctly, it was based on a more correct reading, but it was a revised version of the French edition. The Urdu version I looked at today here in the Royal Asiatic Society Library is taken directly from the Arabic, albeit from one of those uh, modern, possibly one of the, the uh, uh, Paris Arabic editions, but it's full of footnotes drawing upon European scholarship. Again, these kind of collaborations then across Eurasia, rather than, as it were, continuities of ancient knowledge. Well, I'll be finishing off in a minute now. I'm taking up more time than I intended. Vocabulary, too, across for China, really difficult, of course. The Chinese written system, as challenging as the Japanese, perhaps more so in so far as, of course, there are much longer tradition of text to read. So one of the very few language guides in Middle, or, Middle East, North, South Asian languages I found to Chinese was uh, here in Hindi and Urdu, but transliterations of the pronunciation of Beijing spoken uh, Cantonese dialect, presumably, by soldiers who were stationed during the Boxer War uh, in, in Beijing. So a considerable vocabulary of spoken Chinese, but not not a book for translating texts. A remarkable figure there. And it's actually perhaps China's most marginalized community who become its greatest interasian interlocutors, translators in the early 20th century. A number of Hui Muslim, Chinese Muslim uh, scholars, who through these new steam and print networks go to study in India, sailing from Shanghai to Calcutta, and then go to study in Lucknow, and indeed sailing on from there, in some cases more directly to study Al-Azhar in Cairo. One figure I, I, I uh, wrote about then is Hai Yang, a Hui Muslim, or known as Badruddin Sini in Arabic, Badruddin Chini in Urdu. And he actually wrote for his Indian co-religionist a history of China's religion, that religion being Islam, a history of the Chinese Muslims in Urdu, a whole book, 200 pages. There's even a preface at the beginning explaining by his former Urdu teacher, explaining that he wrote it in Urdu himself. We also have, at the same time then, another Chinese Hui Muslim scholar or student who goes to uh, Cairo, and while he's there, as well as writing an Arabic history of the Chinese Muslims, translates directly from classical Chinese, the Analects of Confucius. So we do have them, particularly by the 1920s and 30s. So this is, it were, capacity building then of translators directly from languages. But still, even as late as the 30s and beyond, there are, as it were, cooperations with European scholars, with the earliest direct translations from classical Chinese texts into Turkish then, here by Muhadari uh, Nabi Özdedim, a uh, Turkey's first pioneering sinologist. She'd learned Chinese with Wolfram Eberhardt, one, a number of, one of a number of uh, German uh, liberals, Jewish scholars, and other anti-Nazis who found refuge in the universities of Ataturk's Turkey in the 1930s. And through these collaborations then, Eberhardt teaching Özdedim Chinese, Eberhardt even created uh, uh, modern Turkish's first formal transliteration system of Chinese terms into Turkish then. These cooperations then were taking place then uh, and enabling these new levels of inter-Asian inter understanding. So some of them, my findings then, is first of all really recognizing the difficulties, the challenges of inter-Asian understanding. What was involved, what hurdles had to be overcome? Realizing that the pan-Asianist paradigm, the ideology of Asian unity, doesn't actually take us very far once we get into the, the nitty-gritty of attempts to under, overcome these challenges. And indeed, hardly any of the couple of hundred or so texts I looked at were written by known, known figures or indeed pan-Asianists. 
it was these lesser known unsung inter uh, interpreters, as I call them and dedicate the book to them, that did the hard intellectual interpretive work. And finally then, what I hope I've shown it through what I call here this dialectic of discovery, is then a whole series of Eurasian intellectual networks and corporations that actually ultimately allow different parts of the Asian continent to come to understand, sometimes critique, and in other cases, uh, appreciate and even convert to one another's religions and cultures. Thank you for bearing with me. I am, Please stay put. Yeah, Please I'm stay ready put. for questions. Um, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I think you, well, introduced us to and then taken us on a journey through, obviously, what awaits us in your book. Hopefully, there are some questions from people in the room. Um, there may be questions from people online. I'm not 100% certain, but Matty upstairs will, will alert <laughs> us if there are. So I open the floor to anyone who wants to probe a bit further into what you've just been telling us. I've got a couple of things to ask, but I'll hang back um, for now. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to? Please do, yeah. I've got a question. But one thing that, that puzzles me a bit is you're not getting, and you alluded to it right at the beginning, you're not getting any sort of discussions from a commercial factor. And if you look at, as it were, pre-modern discussions, such as they are, uh, of uh, Arabic travel on that and they see our people and so on. They seem to come entirely from the commercial background. They're not really covered in this. They're interested in ways by this and so on. Uh, is there a sort of another dialogue going on that where merchants, Bengali merchants or Kashmiri merchants or whoever are communicating about if you go to this port, you get brilliant textiles or but it, it doesn't appear in the literature. Well, right, exactly. I mean, th this is what, what's key here, because no doubt throughout history, throughout time and space of, of Asian history, there have been people on the spot, Bengali merchants in Yokohama, yeah. who have learned to speak Japanese, maybe even to read it, learn to learn all sorts more or less about Japanese culture, religion, history, as well as what's available to buy and sell. And yet these weren't the figures then writing texts and making them available back in India or indeed making them available elsewhere. And that's what I'm interested in, trying to understand, well, what, what could ordinary people or literate people across Asia understand rather than individuals on the spot or members of their fellow merchant group when our notional Bengali merchant comes back to Calcutta and says to his colleagues or his sons and heirs, oh, I'll teach you everything I know so you can do the yeah, same. Yeah. So, so yeah, no doubt that that was the case. Absolutely. Well, it all the culture. Well, well, it seems insofar as yeah, that the, yeah. the texts I can establish. Of course, I mean, you know, it may well be that that for this kind of work, there's a you know a whole other frontier which needs to be uh, sort of explored, which is the realm of journals and newspapers. I looked at you know some journals and newspapers, but there's a, you know that's this whole other frontier where we might find who knows what. And obviously, you know, kind of there, we might, you know, like the English language press, of course, the, was the kind of the South, well, you know, the, the English language press that's founded in Japan and China and still goes on to the, today, the Shanghai, whatever it is, the South China Post is or something, yeah. You know, this, these were set up for merchant purposes. So it might well be that someone will find something equivalent in Asian languages, but nonetheless, there, there wasn't any, there weren't any sort of equivalents of, Newspapers being published in Bengali or whatever in Shanghai, you know, but maybe things filtered back into Gujarati newspapers in in, in Bombay, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Very much uh, that. Um, the idea of Asia Act is that the 
Well, well, I think so. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, to, to come back to your, to your opening point, absolutely with with Herodotus. But uh, as you know, no doubt better than I do, Herodotus's Asia is what we now think of what later becomes known as Asia Minor, Anatolia. And it's only then with with Alexander's conquest is like, oh, there's more of this. Let's still call it Asia. And then as late as the 18th century, the European geographers deciding, oh, okay, is it, it'll go up to the Urals. It's all you know, and then Europe. So you know, this this ancient term. Its actual meaning on the ground, its reference, geographical reference, changes over time. Um, but yeah, it's it's only you know millennia later, in large part, really from the 1600s via the the Jesuits in the Ming court in China, Ritchie and others, and then the translations I mentioned into Ottoman Turkish, um, that the term starts to go from being an ent uh, an exonym, an external name, to an entonym in a little way. And to get to the end of your question, then. How much, how meaningful is Asia in Asia itself? Well, whenever I sort of meet, you know, kind of people from Asia in the last few years, people who are sort of primarily sort of operating in their own language, whether, you know, kind of Mandarin or Bangla, whatever it is, I say, yeah, kind of how much in things you read is, you know, is Asia or Adya or Asia? Is that sort of a primary term of self identification, of identification as part of this wider, wider thing? And, and often I'm told, well, yeah, not, not very much at all. Having said that, really kind of from the, well, I got the title of my book, and if I hadn't already spoken so long, I would have finished on, on that last slide, which was uh, the 1947 Asia Relations Conference, it, just a few months before the end of the British Empire in South Asia, that Jawaharlal Nal, Nal Nehru called. And he made this famous speech in this Asia Relations Conference, when Asia is now finding herself again, which led me the title of my book, play on that. But he'd argued, actually, that before the age of empire, that had been the age of connection, empire had broken Asia up, and now we can do it again. I kind of sense argue, despite, you know, kind of stealing his words, eloquent, Herovian as he was, um, nonetheless, I was actually arguing something different. He's actually in the, in the, the age of age of imperial infrastructure, which inadvertently, you know, kind of a story of unintended consequences enabled Asians to find, you know, one of those cultures, even though obviously that wasn't the aim of this infrastructure, um, that this developed a lot. But subsequent decades, and particularly after the Bandung moment in the 60s, there were more translations, there were attempts actually to create dictionaries. But still between so many Asian languages today, we don't have, you know, kind of direct dictionaries or grammars, we have really, relatively few specialists in, in certain countries sort of on the ground. Um, and most translations, as far as I can tell, when looking at WorldCat and, and so on, do seem to, uh, to be sort of by European pivot languages. But nonetheless, there has been, you know, post the 60s, especially past the, the 80s and 90s, of course, in the era of the liberalization of various uh, European, sorry, Asian travel markets, as well as economies, there's been sort of, you know, kind of a wider literature. And then the, the more by way of uh, uh, dictionaries as well. Uh, yeah, so you know, kind of different periods rather than one seamless 
continuity from the ancient Silk Road of sort of Roman Han China, 20th century. Robert. Thank you, I was wondering whether there was a parallel story, an inverted parallel story. Of it. Would be a what's it? Mentioned this. And he saw, you know, a much more simple mirror. And, and um, but I was wondering whether your kaleidoscopic uh, vision of Asia, what was going on this time, would, would, would result in a, a similar recapture. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't, I mean, you know, as, as you all know, as well as I do know, there's, you know, there's a whole body of scholarship sort of, you know, post Said that's, uh, that's, you know, not necessarily Saidian scholarship per se, but has, you know, looked at the way in which, let's say, the sonology that emerges out of the French Enlightenment, or indeed the sonography or sinophilia of the French Enlightenment, becomes a way of critiquing, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 um, uh, what's it called, the uh, autocratic state in pre-revolutionary France and so on, or the lettre persin of Montesquieu as an earlier example of a sort of a fraudulent way of ventriloquism. So, yeah, so I don't have anything more to, more to add to those things. But what I will add, though, is what I have sort of been doing is and, and recognising is is whether there's a, rather than, let's say, a sort of a Saidian mirror of, you know, Europe projecting itself, you know, its fantasies onto, a, you know, fan, a fantasy orient, for its you know, nefarious power-based purposes, this idea model. What I've actually found is that um, I think rather than actually seeing, oh, well, other Asians, are, they're, 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 or they're be becoming part of, uh, they're falling for this Orientalism. When we see, uh, you know, kind of Orientalist or missionary translations of Chinese being translated in Urdu, I don't see this as problematic in a way that a Saidian reading might. I actually see it as, as, as ways of not only, um, well, I'll give you a concrete example. How do you make, when ancient, the, the ancient Chinese texts like the Shu Jing, uh, the, the classic of history, as it was often called, have a sort of a dating system, which is not gonna be commensurable, not gonna be sort of transferable into an Indian language or Middle Eastern language, not least because such is the antiquity of Chinese historiography and its chronology, that in Islamic languages, there's no such equivalent to BC. There's no before Hijra. You haven't got a dating system, really, that goes back. It's not being used for before 622. So it's the Christian calendrical system. Chinese uh, Chinese chronology being established by Gobil, I think it is, a French Jesuit scholar, being worked out in terms of the Christian calendar, which then gets used as a chronological pivot into Indian languages there. So, you know, there is this sort of ways of enabling that I wouldn't see, okay, we know now as world historians that, you know, you, the Christian, what we have to call the common era, isn't the world's only dating system. But one needs a, you know, a standard system, or at least a pivot system to be able to make others intelligible. So, you know, that's a way that I think is as objective as any dating system can get. These are sort of, you know, more empirical ways in which the, you know, this sort of mirror of Orientalism, in a way, I think actually enables uh, a good deal of sort of inter -Asian understanding. Could I just ask something? Oh, I'll come back to you in a second. Could I just slip yeah. in? Talking about the, uh, well, you talked about pivot chronologies almost, yeah. but you've talked a lot in your, in your 
talk this evening about pivot languages and just their importance of their role. Yeah. I just want to say, being slightly sort of cheeky, if you've got any examples of where pivot languages just completely got it wrong, or at least, you know, um, <laughs> complicated, confused, misled, the kinds of interactions that obviously you've told us a lot about, because I suspect that they may have Oh, uh, uh, yeah. From time to time, and it'd yeah. be fascinating to know a bit yeah. more about that. I, I'm glad you gl glad you are asked this, actually, Sarah. So, so yeah. So, I mean, in an even longer version of the talk, of course, so, you know, kind of it would have been clear that let's say our Jesuit translators they're learning from the Confucian literati of Ricci in in, in Beijing. All of our European middlemen, in a sense, have got their Asian colleague teacher whether in Beijing, whether in Istanbul, wherever it is. So, you know, it's a sort of a, a sort of a multi-tier, you know, Europeans learn from Asians and then other Asians learn from the Europeans, yeah. et cetera. And that's even on the positive side when yeah. they're getting it yeah. more or less right by the standards of the time. Yeah. But there are also, yeah, a whole series of mistakes. I mean, one of the most sort of egregious I found was there's a, trying to think of his name, a rather uh, notorious 19th century uh, uh, Ukrainian, um, or actually, maybe actually, I think Russian, I don't know, or Jewish, UK, Ukrainian, Imperial Russia, who writes this uh, text claiming, Notovich, that's his name, uh, claiming that uh, he'd been to a monastery in Tibet and found there a Tibetan manuscript that gave uh, absolute historical proof that after his death, Jesus hadn't died. So after the crucifixion, he'd gone to India and he'd gone to Tibet, and he was the origin of Buddhism, and he was the figure there. And then this actually gets trans takes off in a whole range of in Indian lands, including influencing the Ahmadiyya Muslims. But then um, we actually have in turn then an Indian uh, explorer, an Indian Punjabi Christian, who decides to go up to Little Tibet, go up to various monasteries, have a sort of a Tibetan who speaks Urdu through trade at that point, uh, help him speak to various lamas in the monastery's libraries and establish that no such thing ever happened. And yet still that text had been translated and you know, still has an effect today on, let's say, various sort of Muslim and Indian doctrines of, the, of Jesus in India. There are other examples of that too. When, um, let me see, of uh, certainly just simply outdated uh, uh, European accounts of China and Japan in particular that were translated into Persian and Iran, sort of didn't have access to the latest books. So by the time they were printed, they're absolutely out of date. You know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, kind of just, just wrong to begin with. And there's one other kind of, let's say, fraud. Yeah, the, the medieval fraudulent gospel of Barnabas, which seems to be written in sort of medieval Al-Andalus, sort of a fraudulent sort of gospel, which, which has a much more, what seems to be a more Muslim version of the story of Jesus. It's a fraudulent gospel. That gets translated into a series of, uh, of Middle Eastern languages then as well, and I think also into Urdu. So yeah, there's a whole. I'm glad you asked that. There's a whole series of yeah, yeah. misinformation. You know, this is the a public series of print, not as bad as our internet, but you know, it's still as uh, you know, it's still full of these polemics and misinformation too. You know. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. I uh, disagree. Uh, your talk was exclusive. Once the archives were finally published, but I also wanted to. Uh, Ask you about pivot because I've uh, I've often wondered uh, much earlier um, about the early discrimination of Buddhism. Very much, and I've often thought, how did those uh, missionaries or areas of Buddhism? Out from southern India, uh, probably Project Pillar Book, um, that text. I should be doing that, I could do more clearly by that. And coming to southern Thailand and preaching their, uh, their gospel to a completely un um, work for community, none of those languages. And one has to think of comes from a um, and also, I think the, the, the use of pictorial images mm -hmm. 
um, which is Later transmission of you get reference really used. Yeah. So, um, right, I, I thought it was fascinating. Past five months. Four centuries. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not a evidently uh, far from an expert, but I'm a sort of enthusiast of ancient history. And as I understand it, Soldier, the language that obviously doesn't exist anymore, was an important, I think we might call that a pivot language yes, across the yes. Silk Road, not necessarily for the transmission of Buddhism, but perhaps also for maybe yes. Manichaeism or Christianity, yeah. But I think one of the things we have to think about with with the, the transmission of Buddhism is what we're dealing here is with the members of the Sangha, these are monks already literate, they're trained in language, perhaps depending when they're going to China, by the time the transmission of Buddhism to China, um, the language they're probably learning their Buddhist sutras in, Pali or Sanskrit, is already for them, probably by then, a learned language anyway, not a first spoken oh, language. Um, so these are already literate figures. And, and I think when they're acting in an institutional context, at least, in monasteries or interacting with other literate figures, I think there are, let's say, I mean, of course, we, we know from the, the Ming period, there are Ming dictionaries of Persian. It's just that they weren't necessarily available or accessible throughout later centuries, you know. So I'd imagine these kind of these such either either dictionaries or translations were made by interactions between intermediary figures, but yeah, maybe also with, with pivot languages. And you know, I, I hope there are specialists out there, as I'd imagine, perhaps even in the room here with, with Susan. Uh, yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, uh, that, that that would have happened. Yeah, but I think the sort of the, the pivot idea. I think it is a a broader world historical process. It's not story of Orientalism. This is just how different cultures sort of interact, especially different writing systems, you know, kind of thing as well. Yeah, yeah, indeed, exactly. The sheer range of language families in Asia. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, that, that was interesting about the... Um, um, about um, the gospel of Barnabas. I still have the greatest page on the this and also that Jesus is the enemy of the Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, but what I wanted to ask was about also about the packages problem. Yes, um, so, Sean Zhang, I find it really interesting that in uh, Afghanistan, uh, that was translated through Tamil Theater. Uh, I thought it would come through a Persian translation of these also there. That, that's, that's really interesting. Um, my question is, did, um, did this knowledge of Buddhism in places like um, Iran, the Middle East, maybe Central Asia, did that remain within the realm of, sort of like, with the Shwanzang's translation or through archaeology or through this like, nationalized version of Buddhism? What did these um, interactions with um, Japanese and Chinese scholars, did that induce kind of like lived understanding of what's sort of a lot of what well, well, there's, a, there's a, a mix of those. I, I should add that the the translation of Xuanzang that I showed that that, that was an Urdu translation. Whether it, it circulated up to Afghanistan, it was printed in Lahore, if I remember correctly, and a lot of books from Lahore went up to Afghanistan because obviously the Indian print market was way bigger. Um, but um, what's happening in particularly what you know, I wrote an article. Some well, you'll know it. The sort of the Afghan discovery of Buddhism there right, years ago, and that was really the French archaeologists who were allowed into Afghanistan. You all know this, I mean, but others perhaps won't. Precisely because the, the Af Afghan government didn't want the Brits in, didn't want any archaeologists, didn't want you know anyone other than the political agent they're required to have by Treaty of uh, Ralph Pindi or whatever else, um, Treaty of Gandamak or Ralph Pindi. So, um, but the French were allowed in as a neutral power, and then we have from the twenties. Then we also have the first French medium school founded in Kabul. So the earliest from the twenties onwards, then. You know, I, I sort of showed that even by about 1910, there's an Afghan series of geography school books being printed, printed in Lahore for the Afghan government and, and schools. And there's a section on the different religions of Asia. And it explains that I think it says there are three religions in the world. There's Islam, there's Judaism, there's Christianity. And the other one is Budpadasti, idol worship. And that's everything else, including, you know, the section on China, the religion is Budpadasti, idol worship, or 
a word, of course, ironically, but is coming to the Persian from the ancient Sanskrit word bod for the enlightened one, isn't it? But that meaning is of a specific person rather than an idol has gone. But then by the 20s then, yeah, there's this sort of Afghan rediscovery through collaborations, cooperations with the French. A lot of French texts are translated. But there's also a number of Indian scholars that come to teach, for example, at Habibia College, these first modernizing high schools in Afghanistan. We have a French one, we have a German one, we have an English one by the 20s. And there's a particular Indian figure whose who's name I can't think of, uh, who starts drawing upon works like the Cambridge History of India and translating sections of that into Persian as well. So we actually have a pretty rapid shift from but, idol, that's what Buddhism is, but Padasti, idol, idol worship, to a notion of the Mazhabi board, the religion of board, a specific figure, or indeed in some cases, just the wholesale transliteration of Buddhism as a term into, I've seen in, in Urdu as well as Persian then, for, for want of a, of a sort of a, a term, an indigenous term in, in Persian or Urdu. And of course, I'm full aware that we have Rashid ad-Din in the 13th century, in the Mongol period, detailed accounts of, of Buddhism by a, what seems to have been a Kashmiri intermediary. Um, but yeah, but you know, Rashid ad-Din's text wasn't printed anywhere in the Middle East, the medieval Persian text, until the late 1930s. You know, by which point then there'd be another, you know, accounts in Persian magazines, Iranian, as well as Afghan, of, of Chinese as well as Japanese Buddhism. Uh, but the archaeology has a sort of a big part as well, uh, you know, kind of, I think, as a as a sort of a spur to excavation for local recognitions, for the scholarship that's published, and then for translations, and then for postage stamps, you know, kind of not least, like that 1931 one, which was withdrawn, apparently, local objection. I think, bearing in mind the time, Alison, just let me know what time it is, you're coming up to quarter past eight. Um, I think it's been a long session. There have been some really, I think, probing questions with very full answers. Um, in order to maybe enjoy a bit more of the hospitality, perhaps a bit of chatting amongst ourselves, I think this is the point where we need to bring, you know, the formal side of the evening to a conclusion. And just to thank Niall again for telling us so much about his book. <laughs> Well, yeah, and thank you all for coming out on uh, on a Tuesday night, and uh, yeah, and for bearing with me throughout. Yeah. Uh, so, this is a drink. Yeah. Um,